afternoon session uh, one just a couple of announcements community support volunteers for the afternoon are Karen Coyle and Chad Nelson they have the zebra lanyards but for funsies can you please stand Chad and Karen so people can see identify you perfect thank you um, and the online community support vo support volunteer is Ann Slaughter on slack she's a slaughter so if you have any problems please reach out to her also very good to uh, recognize that this conference would not be possible without the work of our um, LPC, our local planning committee. Um, so I want to take a minute to thank them. Um, Eric Petaplace with the California College of Arts. Aaron Collier, y'all can stand, uh, with Stanford University. Uh, Mark Matienzo, Matienzo with Stanford as well. And Roy Tennant, free agent, and ne'er do well. You can decide what that means. Um, there's a quiet room available on the second floor um, on the other side of the lobby in the Zinfandel meeting room. You can find information about it on the accessibility page on the conference website. That's under general information for the top main menu. Uh, so there's that. Bathrooms, uh, the ones that you guys have seen immediately out here, you've probably seen the signs there, gender, gender neutral bathrooms. Uh, the ones upstairs are not, but there are more bathrooms upstairs. Um, the far right restrooms have the urinals in them. You can decide which gender neutral restroom you want to go in based on that information. If you are a presenter and you didn't sign the speaker consent form at registration, please stop by and complete that form um, to either confirm or decline the streaming of your session and sharing of your materials. Also for mics, uh, for the mic minders and asking questions, we don't need to touch the buttons to turn them on and off. That's being controlled in the back, so just hand it over. We don't want to mess with anything because if we turn it off, then they have to wait to turn it back on. Electronics are kind of annoying that way. So now, without further ado, we're going to introduce the, our first talk, which is Emily Higgs from North Carolina State uh, with Natural Language Processing for Discovery of Born Digital Records. Hi everyone, and my name is Emily Higgs. I'm really happy to be here today. This is my first time at Code for Lib, and I realize today it's also my first presentation as a librarian and not as a graduate student. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very exciting day for me. Um, so I am an, currently an NCSU Libraries Fellow at NC State University Libraries. My presentation today will focus on my work applying natural language processing technologies in uh, concrete ways to make incremental and sustainable improvements to library services. Uh, specifically, I am situated in the NCSU Special Collections Research Center at D.H. Hill Junior Library, where I work in the digital program, um, specifically on our born digital archival collections. So the two problems that I'm uh, currently working on um, applying natural language processing to address um, are first, how do we describe large digital collections quickly and efficiently, either automated or semi-automated? And how can we enhance discovery for researchers who are looking for specific names and topics in those digital collections? So um, natural language processing is that I'm going to be talking about today, but more specifically for my presentation, um, what we're primarily interested in right now is named entity recognition. Uh, I do want to acknowledge that many others have done work in this space. Um, work in this space, particularly in the past few years, has primarily um, taken the work of application development and creating new applications. Uh, some of these projects are very similar to my work, but are no longer supported by their host institutions. Some operate in a more specific domain, such as email archiving in the, um, in the case of EPAD and Tomes. And some are a single case study that haven't produced a broader implementation. Um, some of these people are here today. Thank you. Um, also, I should add uh, Dominique Lester's team to this slide. Thank you, Dominique, for a really wonderful presentation earlier today. Um, so most of these projects uh, 
are quite resource intensive, um, particularly in regards to computational power. Named entity recognition does take a lot of resources to be able to do and to be able to do quickly. So my work, um, as I said, really focuses on incremental changes to our existing workflows in the archive. Um, I, my work is pre-production. I'm really focused on lightweight solutions that, are, first of all, can run on staff computers and are generalizable to our different uh, collections and collection sizes, and also very usable, especially for our student assistants who are learning both about uh, Born Digital Collections and about the many tools we use on those collections to ingest and process them and make them accessible. So both of the ongoing projects that I'll be discussing today are tested on the Tom Reagan papers. Um, this is a hybrid collection, um, including the files from the computer of Tom Reagan, who was a very, very influential philosopher and activist for animal rights and animal welfare. Uh, that is a collection strength for the Special Collections Research Center at NCSU um, and is part of an area we are currently digitizing with a clear grant. So the first project I'd like to talk about is um, my work using Python scripts to use um, named entity recognition in order to automate the description of our digital collections. Um, so I'm using Jupyter Notebooks um, with Python scripts um, as well as Conda environments to be able to run these scripts on different computers with a simple UI that is both usable by our student workers but also um, they can see what's going on under the hood. I believe that there's a session later on Jupyter Notebooks as applications, very excited for that. Um, so my approach here is really to use small uses of this technology and to build on what works, perhaps later leading to um, development with our wonderful team of librarians and developers at NC State Libraries. So this is a visualization of um, the script that I have written in order to extract uh, named entities from a large, uh, primarily text-based collection um, that is born digital. Uh, I'll point out that all a student has to do in this workflow is point to the directory where the logical copy of the digital collection exists and also um, specify what kind of entity they're interested in extracting. Um, I've used this primarily with people, so a lot of my data cleaning methods are um, kind of specifically for that use, but you can also look at um, organizations, geopolitical entities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, a lot of the problems with named entity recognition on large messy data sets um, is the messiness of the data. Um, NER typically extracts quite a bit of junk, um, which has been expressed in a lot of write-ups of the previous projects that I've mentioned as kind of one of the primary pain points. So most of my efforts have been focused um, on data cleaning for this project. These are some of the key packages and libraries I've used. I'm um, scripting in Python, specifically. Um, I will point out that I used Spacey over um, NLTK or uh, Stanford NER. Um, I like Spacey because it's uh, built for production. It doesn't have nearly as many customization options as NLTK, um, but it is simpler and more streamlined. Um, Stanford NER is also really great, but for somebody of my experience and skill level, I found Spacey a little bit easier to use. Um, and the output of this script is a um, CSV or a set of CSV where the entities are ranked by frequency in a collection. So, um, this is an example of a list comprehension in Python that I've used to, to clean the data a little bit and the data before and after that list comprehension. As you can see, like I said, there is a lot of junk that Spacey is pulling up. Um, so what I did here is specify that I only want the um, people entities if the first and last letter of that entity is alphanumerical and if there is a space in the name. So this specifically is getting rid of um, everything that's junk and everything that's not a full name. Um, unless you're really intimately uh, familiar with the collection, a first name isn't gonna be super useful and giving you a bird's eye view of who is mentioned in the collection. Um, but I will also point out, um, first of all, that this is a really Western normative way to um, normalize names. Um, so I'm interested in expanding that for that reason, as well as there is quite a bit of risk for data loss, um, as I'm sure some of you immediately thought. 
Um, I did, in our test collection, scrutinize kind of the results, um, the before and after data sets, and it is mostly getting rid of um, the junk that you don't really want. There is a risk for data loss, but because I'm using um, named entity recognition to get an automated bird's eye view of the collection um, that is interested primarily in which entities are mentioned the most frequently, a little bit of data loss is not as um, catastrophic as it would be maybe for a researcher who is looking for every instance of an entity. Um, so the output is a CSV with entities ranked by frequency. Um, what we're doing with that data is um, taking the top five or ten and um, using it as a scope and content note um, in archive space. And then that data is pulled into our um, online finding aids so a researcher can see the names that are most frequently associated with the collection. Um, this information, the full CSVs, are also currently being provided to researchers as a part of the information package when they're requesting the Tom Reagan collection to look at. Mm -hmm. So the second um, way that we're using named entity recognition in um, the archives right now is to facilitate user searching and browsing. Um, the use case for this is pretty specific. It is uh, researchers who are using the reading room computer to access our born digital collections. We don't um, currently uh, allow um, remote browsing of our born digital materials quite yet. Um, so we're, uh, th this use case is for researchers who are looking at a large volume of born digital materials, perhaps a, an entire collection or maybe two. Um, so our current workflow, or I guess our prior workflow for um, providing access to these collections are that a researcher via an online request form will request the files or the collections that they're interested in. That's given to SCRC staff um, via a really nifty little application called Circa that my colleagues have developed. Um, which is open source and available. Um, so then the SCRC staff, um, when a researcher is coming in, loads that information, um, those read-only copies, onto a uh, Mac uh, laptop for the reading room. And researchers view those materials in the reading room in a read-only capacity and request duplications um, as needed. So my approach to improving this workflow in particular um, is really inspired by the way that um, other digital archivists and researchers have improved processing and ingest by borrowing from digital forensics tools. So that I thought that kind of a natural extension of um, that relationship would be to borrow discovery tools from the field of e-discovery, specifically for lawyers and journalists. That seems like a natural extension to me. So while researching, um, while researching uh, e-discovery open source alternatives, as e-discovery software is very, very expensive typically, um, I came across a, a program called Open Semantic Desktop Search, um, which is by Marcus Mandelka. Uh, this is a uh, virtual box uh, Debian application that um, is built, is open source and customizable, and it's built on a tech stack that has quite a bit of precedent in libraries and archives, as you can see on my slide. It has a lot of functional overlap with some of the applications and projects that I've um, previously listed. Um, and this is what the interface looks like. It is um, kind of a very similar uh, search and advanced search um, interface that researchers uh, are really used to. It also has semantic search and fuzzy search capabilities, which uh, researchers like a lot. Um, the primary um, feature that has uh, received the most amount of attention by researchers that have tested this is the um, faceted search capabilities. You can facet by date as uh, if the uh, documents have accurate date metadata, um, as well as the entities that are being extracted with Spacey. Um, you can also see here that there is a document preview um, feature where you can see the search terms in um, the document itself. Um, text and image um, documents are uh, supported. The uh, application will also open documents in LibreOffice. So um, if a researcher is not particularly interested in the original computing environment, um, that's been sufficient for our uses. It also has um, analysis capabilities, so you can see visualizations of trends in your search terms over time, as well as um, network visualization of entities and documents. So 
So we've done some pre preliminary user tests um, that have been mostly positive. Researchers really like the um, fuzzy and semantic search options and the filtering capabilities. There is a little bit of customization that I would like to do with this program um, for our particular uses. The major drawback is the time it takes to index. Um, so in our workflows, we're loading kind of a collection or a group of files at a time into this program. Um, the Tom Reagan collection, it took about 20 hours to index all of that, um, which does currently work in our workflow where researchers are uh, requesting materials that we then load onto a computer anyway, but um, is not uh, sustainable in the long run if we want it to browse very, very large numbers of collections all at once. Um, okay, I think I'll speed it up a little bit. So um, future extensions for this, like I said, I would like to uh, customize uh, the Open Semantic Search application for our uses um, and do more user testing to see what works and what doesn't before we invest uh, time and staff and resources into creating a, a completely custom application. Um, I'm also experimenting with different types of other natural language processing and machine learning tools to be able to um, see what works and what doesn't for that. We've done some work with topic modeling. Um, I'm very, very skeptical of topic modeling for our purposes, which I'd, I'll talk more about if anybody is interested in that. Um, I'm also looking at document clustering as something that's um, been interesting for navigation purposes. And we'd also like to fully integrate those um, first Python scripts that I've mentioned into our processing and ingest wizard to completely automate that process of getting that data into archive space and the finding aid. Um, so I would like to thank my colleagues who have helped me with this project as well as um, my presentation, especially Brian Dietz, who is my supervisor. Um, and I believe I've left time for maybe one or two questions. If you don't want to wait for the microphone, I'll also accept uh, questions via Twitter or email. Thank you so much. I'm live. Good job. All right. Thank you, Emily. Um, let's see if I can get back to. Next up, we've got Tim Walsh uh, with Concordia University building REST API backed single page applications, acronym does SPAS. I don't think they're nearly as relaxing, with Vue.js. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, let me just pull this up. There we go. Okay. Start a timer to keep me honest. So today I'm going to be talking about Vue.js, which is a, a JavaScript framework um, that I've been using lately, which I really enjoy, and I thought maybe other people would too. Um, this is a bit of a different kind of talk than what I'm used to giving. Um, I generally work in digital preservation. Um, I've done some software development over the past few years through that. Um, but starting last summer as a, a fellow at the uh, Library Innovation Lab at Harvard, um, I started working on this project called Bulk Reviewer, um, which is a software project for identifying and managing private and sensitive information in digital archives. There are lots of tools already for the identification part, the management part less so. Um, and so far, the tech stack for this has actually been two separate applications. There's a backend Django application that exposes an API using the Django REST framework. Um, and then there's a separate Vue.js front end, um, which I'm looking to kind of package as a desktop application, essentially using Electron. Um, and I've just enjoyed the experience of that so much after some false starts with things like React um, that I thought maybe I should give a talk about it. Um, so Vue um, just turned five. Um, it was created by Evan Yu, formerly of Google, um, and the latest version is Vue 2, um, as of last week, 2.6.6, um, but there's a third version um, coming out somewhere on the horizon. I don't know if there's a definitive date yet. Um, and they build Vue as the progressive JavaScript framework, which means um, that it's incrementally adoptable. So you can implement it only where you need a little bit of interactivity in a web page or a template, um, something that we like, have often used things like jQuery for, or you can build an entire application using nothing but Vue um, with some of the tooling that I'll talk about a little later, and it kind of does the full spectrum of that pretty well, I think. 
Um, it can also be installed um, you know, locally with something like NPM or Yarn, um, or if you just want to link out to a CDN, um, similar to how we would often load something like jQuery, you can do that too. Um, so Vue has gotten a lot of popularity in the last couple of years. If you look at JavaScript developer surveys, um, it's often listed as one of these frameworks that's um, something that people really like and want to learn, um, but that maybe hasn't gotten quite as much adoption. Um, so there was, um, you know, last year caught up with React in terms of the number of stars on GitHub, but if we actually look at the number of downloads and uses in the world, um, they're not really quite the same and probably won't be. Um, but that's okay, because I think they do different things and appeal to different audiences. Um, so why should you care? Um, I'll say one is because, and I think this really matters for our community, um, this is a community that really values good, clear documentation and tutorials, which has made um, using Vue a real joy. I learned Vue while building this project, and that was actually kind of feasible, which is, which is really nice, although I would do some things differently, which I'll talk about later. Um, and because if we already have existing databases, backends, APIs, this gives us a way to change up our front end applications um, without having to change everything about our application through the whole stack, um, which is really nice because we can quickly kind of deploy something, try it out, change it uh, if we like it, uh, or sorry, prototype something. If we like it, maybe deploy it. Um, but it gives us ways of, of playing with our data, visualizing it in ways that are a, a little different and maybe more in line with people's expectations for modern web applications. Um, and if you are already um, into things like Django, um, this certainly appealed to me. Vue is very um, opinionated. Um, so there's like a single library for state management, there's a single library for routing, um, and you can do other things, um, but you don't have to make all these micro decisions and depend on a bunch of third party libraries. Um, and the real appeal is like something like React or Angular, um, Vue does a lot of work underneath for you um, to make sure that the application is reactive, which means if your data changes, it just changes in the display everywhere where it exists in the application in real time, even if you're sort of filtering it or mapping it or something like that, um, which is really great because it means that we can build more interactive applications. So to look at what this actually means, um, we'll walk through the steps of building a tiny toy project. Um, I've called this project Heavenly Bodies. Um, I have been obsessed with space since I was a little kid. I never really got over the fact that I never went to space camp. So this is like a little bit of making up for that. Um, and there's this really great open notify API called People in Space that will tell us how many people are in space, who they are, and what craft they're on, which is kind of cool. Um, and so for this example, I'll be using ES6 or ECMAScript 2015 JavaScript syntax. So if you wanted to support older browsers, you'd have to um, add in some polyfills or something like that. Um, but there's tooling for that as well that we'll talk about a little later. So the first thing you'd want to do, given an existing HTML page, um, is we want to add our, our link to the CDN at the top to install Vue. Um, and then within the body, we add a div with an ID that we'll call out of convention app. Um, and we'll link out to a separate JavaScript file where we can actually you know, keep our, uh, our Vue application. Um, in that file, which we'll just call index.js for this tiny example, um, we instantiate a Vue application um, that we call app by convention, um, and we point it to that div element where we actually want our application to render. So re remember, we could have this just be like one component within an existing page somewhere. Um, and we declare some data. So for these purposes, uh, we'll just create an empty array called astronauts, where we're going to put information about the people in space. Um, then we need a way to retrieve the data from our API. Um, so this is the first of the view directives that we've seen, uh, which starts with v dash, um, and then in this case, you know, an on click. Um, there's a separate syntax that you can see below that's a little a bit of shorthand. But essentially, we would just want to create a button, say when this button is clicked, then we want to run a function to retrieve our data. In our view application, underneath our data, we add some methods, and we add our function there, get space data. In this example, we use the fetch library. Um, you know, this is a toy example, so you'd, in production, you'd want to do more error handling, things like that. But we go retrieve the JSON from this API um, and then write the objects that we get back to that empty astronauts array that we had. And now we have some data. Um, so this is where we get into how Vue actually helps you display that data. Um, so underneath our button in our HTML template, uh, we can add an unordered list and then use this v4 view directive um, to create a list item for every object in this array that we had pulled down. And then for each one of those, display the name of brief message and the name of the craft. 
um, which in our case, at this point, is just the International Space uh, Station. Um, and this gives us a, a really kind of short, easy syntax to, to loop through um, that's, that's pretty useful. Um, we might want to add a little bit of edge handling, though, um, some conditionals. So, um, you know, this is, I think, very common to a lot of you. Um, it supports if, else, else if statements. Um, using this, this uh, v directive um, syntax again. So we could say, you know, we want a div. Um, if the length of our array is more than zero, then we want a div that will loop through and display each of the astronauts. And if it's not, we want to print this sad message that, sorry, there's no one in space right now. Another way that we could do that uh, is instead, we could just have our count at the top, and then if there actually are any people in space, then loop through and print out each one. And for that, um, we're, we use this property here called astronaut count. Um, but we haven't actually defined that yet. Um, and this gives us an opportunity to talk about computed properties. I think this is um, a really cool thing in view. Um, so you can define computed properties that are essentially functions that just return a different representation of data that you already have. So in this case, we can just return the length of our array and use that instead of saying, you know, this.astronauts.length everywhere. Instead, we just have this shorthand where we can use a variable. Um, but in larger product, projects, say you have a component, you want to pass down, um, say you want to do pagination. And so you don't want to pass to a component all of the data for everything in our array. We only want to pass the first 10. Um, we could filter our existing data, um, create just a representation um, you know, of those 10, and then pass that to our component, something like that. Um, so here you can filter, you can um, do like map. Um, if you want to get just, just the IDs of each of your elements, you could do something like that. And it gives us a way of creating, again, this really reactive, easy to use representation of a subset of our data or a modified version of our data that will um, kind of reflect across the whole of our application. Um, so the result is we get this little application. Um, when you load it up, it says number of people in space zero. You click the API button, and then it tells us who's in space, which is kind of cool, I think. Um, but, you know, that's just a toy example. So what if we actually wanted to build a single page application, like a larger application? Um, well, this is where I should probably define what a single page application is. Um, so single page applications are web applications, typically, that load all of the assets, all the HTML, CSS, JavaScript up front, and then dynamically change the content on the page instead of actually linking and loading new pages um, when the data changes. Um, and this allows us to have a cleaner separation of our backend applications and our front ends. We don't have uh, all of our sort of JavaScript logic, say, in like Django templates or something like that. And we can communicate back and forth between the two, either through REST APIs or something like WebSockets. Um, the pros of this model um, are that it's really easy to build these kind of interactive applications that are easy to build, that are only presentational, that are easier to replace and modify without having to get into the business logic of the back end. Um, but, you know, these more complex front ends means we now have, um, in my case, instead of one application, there's two applications to maintain, which is a, a real thing that we would want to consider. Um, and there's notoriously some difficulty with things like search engine optimization. Um, and, you know, I, um, a lot of uh, JavaScript developers were arguing very heatedly on uh, Twitter um, recently because, you know, with a lot of these React and Vue kind of applications, it's really hard for an end user to just right-click, save view source, and see what's going on. Um, if you try that um, with, like, modern applications, unless the developers put in a lot of effort to make that work, often you get this really not human-readable code with crazy IDs and, um, yeah, it's not very user-friendly. Um, but there are ways around that. And the general way that we want to structure a single page application, and certainly a view application, is we want to break our web page into um, chunks, and then we create a component for each of those, and we can nest these into a tree shape, and we can pass data from the parent um, uh, components to the child components using things that are uh, called props, and that, this comes from the, the React ecosystem. Essentially, it's just we're passing down data from the parent to the child. Um, when we're creating all these applications, we want to try to make them reusable as much as possible. And Vue encourage us to, encourages us to create a separate .view file uh, called a single file component for each one of these components um, that we can then sort of logically organize into modules if we want. And the thing that I really like about Vue components compared to, say, React if you've used like JSX or something like that, is it's actually just broken into three parts that really cleanly reflect HTML, JavaScript, and CSS, which are technologies that we all know and have been around for a long time and will continue to be around for a long time, which makes it really easy also to bring new people on a project 
onboard, train, things like that. Um, in a large project, you probably don't want to have all of your components separately accessing the backend and handling different data independently. Um, so it's encouraged to use a single store to handle your state or your data. Um, Vue comes with a state management pattern and library out of the box called Vuex for this, um, but you can also use Redux if, you, if you're already familiar with that or using it for other applications. And these are all based on the flux pattern, which is something that I would encourage you to go read the documentation for um, if you're looking at building these kinds of applications. We may also want to use routing, which allows us to basically trick the user into thinking that they're going to new pages, even when our page is really just dynamically refreshing. Um, and this also allows us to keep conventions that are really useful, like having semantic URLs that people can use. Um, even if that's not actually loading a new page to an end user, it's going to feel like it is. And that gives us uh, you know, cool URIs that we can continue to use. Um, so there's an official router called View Router. That's pretty well in integrated and easy to use. Um, you set a routing configuration, um, and then you replace your A hrefs with router links um, in your templates. Um, so it's really not that much of a, uh, of a change or departure. Um, I'll say if you're going to build any kind of application, I'd encourage you to use um, some of this tooling. Vue CLI 3 is the one that I've used. It's really nice. It's essentially application boilerplate. It's something like Create React App, if you've used that before. So it'll allow you to pick what components you want. So you can have Vue. You can use different testing or linting um, tools. Um, you can set up a Webpack dev server. You can use Babel to do um, uh, transliteration to older versions of JavaScript so that all of our browsers will be able to run them. There's more opinionated ones as well, like Vue Enterprise boil Boilerplate or Nuxt. Um, and Nuxt is actually pretty cool because it allows you to also do things like server-side rendering and static site generation, which I think people don't often assume you can't really do um, with these kind of newer um, JavaScript single page applications. Um, Finally, I'd encourage you to take a look at the style guide. Um, I'd encourage you to do this particularly because I did not and I regretted it. Um, you can actually, if you look at the image on this slide and the one before, you can realize like I used, for example, um, single word component names, which is really discouraged because if there's ever a conflict with uh, HTML elements, uh, that might be a problem. Um, but like the rest of the view documentation, the style guide is really user friendly. Um, it's really cleanly, clearly written. There's lots of examples. Um, so I would say, you know, um, spend some time with it. Um, it doesn't even really take that long, um, and the payoff is pretty significant. Um, so with that, um, thank you, and I'm happy to answer a question or two if we have time. No? Well, I'm on Twitter too much, so, oh, yeah, we do, okay. Just a quick question about the routing. Yeah. Does that produce an actual link? So if I build a URL slashes and I give a link with all of those slashes, I get there or do I have to? Yeah. Sort yeah. So, so it'll get you to the right page uh, or, or the right view of the application, let's say. Um, and you can also, um, uh, it supports, um, I'm blanking on the term, of course. Um, but it also supports functionality so that you don't break things like the back button, um, which in the first kind of iteration of these kinds of applications uh, often were broken, which I, I, you, know, uh, you can imagine would be a pretty significant problem for a lot of users. Um, hi, uh, great presentation. Um, I just wanted to uh, mention that we've, been, we've looked into view um, quite a bit uh, where I'm at. And um, one of the problems we've seen with the single page uh, application approach is um, that certain features have to work when JavaScript might be disabled or turned off. And I don't know if you've thought about that or how you're able to address um, with your work. Yeah, I mean, in the case of my application, I'm looking at uh, essentially bundling it as a desktop application um, or desktop clients that are pointing to a single locally run server. Um, so it's less of an issue um, because, I mean, it, um, but I can imagine that would be a serious problem. And I think that is, um, uh, I, I'm not sure if there's a way around it, honestly. Um, yeah. the, the approach we've taken is to essentially um, 
break it out and not make it a single page app, but to be able to use the components across different applications mm. and have like a no J, you know, no script fallback um, in right. the templates, like in the Rails or, or Django templates um, that might not be pretty, but it, it works. So that's Clever, a possibility. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Next up, we have Sarah Rice and Bern Irizari uh, talking on ethics for information professionals. Okay, so today we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, why it's important to talk about ethics. Um, we'll be introducing a tool to you to kind of help with those conversations, and we'll be kind of sh showing a couple different parts of the tool uh, to kind of get you started. Um, ethics is very, oh, hold on. Oh. <laughs> Ethics is very near and dear to my heart. Um, I have a degree in ethics as well as a degree in library and information science. Um, I have 23 years experience um, doing information architecture um, in my own consulting agency. Um, and a lot of the companies that I work with tend to have competing goals. Uh, the, the goals of the company tend to compete with the goals of the people that they want to serve or their end users. And so there tend to be frequent conversations about, you know, that friction. Um, and so uh, even if we're not calling it ethics or ethical principles, things like that tend to come up a lot. My background is I'm a designer. I was actually trained in fine arts. I can weld. I really enjoy that. Um, essentially, I've always been attracted to big machines. I found myself joining technology when the web was gray, so this is my third go around. I've seen a lot of things happen, and I see us making some of the same mistakes again and again. So when we had an opportunity to start talking about ethics and bringing this to the fore for our community, we were excited to do so. Absolutely. So um, why is ethics important? Um, you know, we've been talking about it for a long time. I, you know, I have a degree in philosophy, so we've been talking about it for a very long time, hundreds, thousands of years. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's not necessarily anything new. And even within the information architecture community, it's definitely been a topic of, of conversation. Um, I'm not going to read all the quotes for you, but I do like a couple of them. Um, uh, we should use ethical principles and codes of ethics to avoid and prevent deleterious effects of technology. Um, I mean, that seems like a no-brainer, um, and yet there seem to be adverse effects of technology going on every now and again. <laughs> um, my favorite, uh, Finn and Hobbes, is it possible that a design could be successful but not good? Um, you know, successful is you, you build something and it meets all the specifications, and yet you put it out in the world and it, it, it seems to not do good. Um, and, uh, you know, my favorite example, I think the flagship example for you know, why we might need ethics in the work that we do. Um, for those of you who might not understand this example, if you just Google Facebook and uh, US elections, um, <laughs> no more said. Um, Sarah, you're so subtle. I know. <laughs> but you know, like there's, a, there's a, a lot of really smart people who have very good intentions who get into a room and work on technology and um, and it's not always the case that great things happen. Um, yeah. And, and things, you know, things happen on a regular basis. I found an article last week about Stanford uh, where there was a data leak um, and very sensitive student um, college application data was, uh, was compromised. So information about financial aid status, um, gender, home address, um, you know, all sorts of things that you kind of don't want getting out um, got out. 
I think also one of the reasons we had a, an a extreme interest in this area is as information workers, we're being asked to take stands in our workplace. And I don't know if everyone's familiar with Liz, um, Liz the Gray. If you haven't seen this Medium post, she, she spoke about how she had been working within the system at Google and she made a choice to leave it. I think these are the places where we're seeing folks unite around concerns they may have with their employer. I hope it doesn't come to that where you're leaving an employer, but I think understanding what the space is, what it means, how to advocate and call for change in an organization is a valuable skill that those who make the applications need to be taking up. So really, I think the, you know, the ultimate point is, um, is that what we build really far outlasts us. And, um, and so it's, it's important to have intention with whatever it is that, that we're doing and have important conversations that can be hard. Like they can be very hard conversations, um, you know, not popular. There have been many times that I'm like the only one in the room kind of going, um, there's a few things that I think we might want to consider and everybody else is like screaming ahead and you know, 20 miles an hour, 50 miles an hour. And you know, it's like, I don't want to be the wet blanket, but um, <laughs> but you know, but it's like, you know, what, whatever it is that we put out in the world is, is out in the world and you know, it's going to be beyond our control. And so, um, yeah. So what, what can we do about this and what have we been doing about this? Well, we've been working on tools. So one of the, one of the reasons that Bern and I are here today giving this talk is because a year ago we were able to get together and, um, organize. Uh, an event at the Information Architecture Summit, now called the Information Architecture Conference. Uh, we had a day-long roundtable where um, academics and practitioners got together and for an entire day talked about ethics and, you know, like what's important to us, you know, what, you know, what does the literature have to say, you know, what are people talking about, um, you know, and, and what is it that's important to us as a field and, you know, what can, you know, what can we learn from other fields that, that need to be, you know, that we need to be learning? Um, and after that day-long roundtable, we were also able to um, have a day-long make-a-thon where we took everything that we had talked about and we're like, let's, let's make something. Let's make artifacts, you know, let's, let's keep the conversation going beyond just this one place in, in time. And, uh, and be able to you know, continue conversation. So we have a picture of, there's a group working on a game in order to kind of like um, start talking about uh, ethics. And um, there's a, a tool that, um, uh, this is the basis of what we're gonna be talking about a little later, um, that, that just helps you to infuse conversations of ethics and ethical principles in whatever kind of scenario, whatever work that you're doing today. So, I'm going to turn it over to Byrne to sure. talk about the ethics canvas. I'm laughing because apparently I like to wear this sweater to conferences. I don't know if you saw that. I was like, what? Okay, Byrne, <laughs> I need some variety. Um, let's talk about the anatomy of the canvas. One of the things, if you guys are involved in startups, you might have seen the lean business canvas. There's a UX canvas. But the goal is to, in one sheet, create a conversation. So we put together an ethics canvas built on some of the work that we did in that round table, but more so as a way to have a tool that people can walk through. We were really excited by what we saw from the Montana State University team this morning because we were calling on some common pieces, so I'm excited to talk to you later. Um, but I'll give you an orientation. So the canvas itself, one sheet, 11 by 17 ideally, we take people through first asking that basic question. Is this an ethical dilemma? Now, most folks go, well, kind of, wouldn't it be clear? The point of having these questions is it gives a team a point to depart on and agree on why it is an ethical dilemma. Because what you may think is an issue for a particular patron or you may think is an issue for the corporation might be different. So answering these questions first lets everybody orient themselves. We then actually had a healthy debate around, well, you know, when you are thinking about the process of an ethical conversation, there are aspects of what's actually happening, the facts in a situation versus the perceptions on the ground. These conversations often involve change management. And understanding what people perceive to be happening could be entirely different than what's going on. So in one of our scenarios that we put forward, and I'll describe those in a minute, there is an, an assumption. We actually put a scenario together that was about union workers and an application that was bringing in some AI. And what the assumption that the union had was that it would replace their jobs, which was not the intention of the project. So that could become part of the scenario that people could work through. 
I'm going to kind of dig into some of the other points of the, of the canvas just to kind of give you some details. We really, we have put these out. We are a very Creative Commons kind of group. We've put these out. We've created a page that we'll show you the URL for where you could download these scenarios. We hope that you'll take them and use them with your teams, use them at the beginning of a project, or use them in an offsite to start this conversation. The scenarios have been generated with things that are meant to inflame conversation and really to press the boundaries. Because the scenario can often let you step away from the problem that is directly happening in your environment um, and use this safe, neutral type of scenario to get at some common goals. Um, the two that you're seeing up here were the ones actually that people gravitated to, not surprisingly, algorithm bias scenario. Uh, this was where you recognize that your development team is not sure, they don't believe that they actually have uh, bias in their algorithm. How do you get them on board to talk about that conversation? And then personal data, this was a really hooked our, our group. Um, a lot of folks wanted to talk about what the implications for patron data were. So mm -hmm. not surprising that these scenarios will have some interest. There are some other ones in there that could be interesting to your team. We also spend a lot of time talking about who could be impacted and who's involved because quite often you as the team that is creating the tool and dealing with the direct on the ground making may not be the only person who has a stake in moving the ethical conversation forward. Okay, and then we also talked a little bit about frameworks. We do not give you a complete set of frameworks you guys may be familiar with or folks might be familiar with the PAPA model. There's a lot of them out there. The goal is to have a conversation about what ethical principles you are going to start from. We suggest you look at things from your organization. We were also excited to see that the Montana team had gone to ACM and ALA guidelines and ethics. We think those are wonderful resources that people should be using. Um, the meat of the conversation really happens in here, which is in this impact matrix, where you will literally take the stakeholders that have been identified in your scenario and you will map the impact a particular value has on someone. So we were gravitating towards quality as one of the key considerations coming out of ACM. What does it really mean for me as a creator, as an information professional, to make sure that I am building quality in, that I am building privacy into my application? And how might I be impacted by that versus the end users of my system? Um, Ultimately, we found that using the ethics canvas can be something that people, we hope, will take into their organizations, whether it's doing it at the inception of your design phase or coming up with your own scenarios and maybe riffing on it a bit and, and framing principles or even a conversation about the principles that govern your team and your organization. With that, I'm just going to zip ahead. want to point out we have a couple of resources available from the conference. Uh, you can see we've created a specific page for that. There are also references if folks would like to dig deeper. Um, the PAPA model, privacy, accuracy, uh, property, and accessibility. I hope you guys have seen it. It was put out in 1986, but please take a look at that, um, as well as some of the references from which we pull quotes um, and the tools that we're dealing with. So with that, um, should we take some questions? Yep. Any questions? OK. All right. Should well, we do a plug for that? Yes. So one thing that I did want to, um, oh, it's not up anymore. OK. Oh, well. One thing that I, I wanted to let you know, so last year we talked about ethics at the Information Architecture Conference. This year we're going to be talking about um, diversity and inclusion. It seems like a, a very logical next step. And so in March in Orlando, um, uh, March 13th and 14th, we're going to be having another roundtable. So day one is going to be, um, you know, lightning talks, people talking about, you know, bringing up topics that we think are very important uh, for the field of information architecture. And, and then the de next day is going to be another makeathon where we make awesome things that come out of it, as you can see. So we invite everybody to come join us. Yes. And please reach out if you have questions, feedback on the tool. We want to iterate further. Thanks so much. Thanks. Thank you, Sarah and Byrne. Um, let's close out. And Emily, you've got your stuff on here, right? OK. Just making sure. All right, next up, we've got Emily, sorry, Linema, Linema awesome, um, from North Carolina State, speaking on consortial discovery and resource sharing, making it happen with mostly standard tools. 
I feel so weird doing a PowerPoint presentation. It's been a long time since I used PowerPoint. We'll try to make it happen here. Um, hi, I'm Emily Leinema. I'm the head of IT and the libraries at NT State. Distinct from Emily Higgs, who's also from NT State this morning, little name overlap. Um, so I'm going to try and stick to my script here because I only have 10 minutes. And as I worked, I thought I'd be able to do this really easily in 10 minutes. And then as I worked on a presentation, I was like, oh, this is really hard to do in 10 minutes. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that just went live at NC State and Duke, um, where we use some mostly standard open source tools to build a new consortial catalog. And I know open source tools for catalog searching is like really old news in the Code for Lib community. What I thought was interesting about this project and what I wanted to share is just um, that we were using Solar and Blacklight in sort of different-ish ways um, to provide consortial discovery. And I kind of wanted to raise awareness of the possibilities of addressing this uh, kind of different use case with these tools. This is not a code presentation, but there is a link at the very end to the repositories that do have all the code. Um, so uh, our local TRLN consortium, which is Duke, um, NC Central, NC State, and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, we have a long history of shared collection development. Um, and the vision for this project was to create infrastructure that provides both institutional and consortial discovery, um, and also have infrastructure that's easier for staff to manage, maintain, and customize institutionally. Now, we have been doing consortial discovery as a consortium since 2008, so um, that's not new, but what we wanted was better tooling. Um, we wanted to replace our existing um, institutional catalogs as well as our consortial tools. Um, we really kind of wanted to learn how to do development together. We hadn't really tried that much as a consortium. Um, and so rather than each of us developing our own thing, uh, we wanted to uh, leverage expertise together across the consortium. Um, and we also wanted to um, ended up piloting um, Amazon Web Services for consortial projects, which was also new for us. Um, so governance, so I'm a department head of IT, so I feel like every meeting that I'm in lately I talk about governance. Um, governance is actually really important to getting things done. Um, so as you, a lot of you know, if you're working in close collaboration with geographically distinct groups, uh, people at different institutions that have different priorities, like that's really challenging. Um, so we started this project with this kind of traditional committee-based approach where everyone had representation, which is really great, but it's kind of a mess in terms of decision making and like actually doing collaborative development, um, especially since all of these groups, uh, which were big, would have to be working together on a daily basis to like actually get anything done. Um, so we realized uh, as we started to get into it, they were like, we need a team. This is my son helping my daughter read her birthday cards. Um, we need a team that could work together closely to just get work done. So we cast it around a bit and we thought, oh right, a scrum team. Um, so while our institutions had used agile principles locally in the past, again, this is something we'd never done consortially. Um, so we had a scrum team and one of the really interesting things about this team was that we had a single product owner from each institution. Um, and this person had the complete decision making authority about requirements and prioritization. So we didn't always have consensus because we're different institutions with different priorities and different collections. Uh, so we voted when we didn't have consensus and we let the majority win. Um, we also had developers from each institution as well as one from our uh, consortial um, body, um, a data expert, a user experience person, um, and someone to sort of get things done. Uh, facilitate us getting things done. We worked in two week sprints. We met in person one afternoon every other week. We did backlog refinement, sprint review and sprint planning and we used Slack. Um, so talking a little bit about choosing the right tool. The community, you guys are amazing. It's come so far since NC State last implemented a catalog in 2006. It's like a long time ago. Um, so when we looked at what, you know, what was out there, um, Viewfind and Blacklight were clearly the things to, um, to look at. We did a technical and functional review and we were like, both of these tools could do what we needed. Um, we chose Blacklight because of its modularity and extensibility. So we knew we wanted a TRLN version of the UI, so we wanted to sort of share our core UI components across our institutions. And then we knew that each institution would have special Snowflake stuff that they wanted to do. Um, Blacklight is a Ruby gem within Ruby on Rails, so it's not as ready to go out of the box, um, but we thought that was actually a plus for the customization we knew we'd need. Um, so these are the components of the project. This is uh, this really beautiful diagram. It was created by our TRLN developer, uh, Jenya Kazimova. Um, so I'm just going to plug her poster session that she's doing at this conference. It's going to talk in detail about the technical infrastructure. So go talk to her if you want to hear more. I'm going to talk to this at kind of a high level. 
Um, so there are kind of three main components to this project that we either created or customized. Each of these has a repository in GitHub that's openly available. Um, one of the first things we realized when we started designing um, this infrastructure was that like ETL is a huge component and it lives outside of solar and blacklight and like it still has to be handled. Um, so we have two components for that. The first we call Mark to Argo. That's a tool for generating an intermediate shared ingest format across institutions. It's based on Traject, which actually came out of people that you all might know here. Um, Traject is an open source metadata transformation tool. So Mark to Argo is basically a set of shared Traject configs and custom methods that we use to take in uh, Mark records across our institutions and output uh, JSON data format that we use locally. Um, and we run this, each of our institutions runs this locally, so we have complete control over it. Um, the next component is uh, what we call the Spofford. Uh, I don't remember where these names came from, but they do have stories. I don't think that's it. <laughs> um, this is a web application with a Postgres database that ingests Mark records, so this is a central tool. Um, it has all our records that are indexed into solar and it gives us a place to enhance records once across four institutions. So for example, we license um, table of contents data from Syndetics that we're allowed to index into our records. Um, it gives us a place to view records sort of in the middle of the process so that it's not a black box and that's really helpful for troubleshooting weird data stuff as you're moving out of Mark and into solar. Um, Spofford talks to solar to ingest, update, and delete records. And then we have uh, TRLN Argon, what we call, which is just a customization layer for Blacklight. And we created a basic Blacklight UI with shared widgets and functionality. And each institution runs its own Blacklight, so you know, we can customize additionally as much as we want. Obviously, there's solar here, too. Um, I don't really have time to do a demo, so I'm just going to show two screenshots. This is the NCSU Libraries catalog. We went live in January, so it's still pretty new. Um, uh, so we have a single interface that provides both searching our NCSU, I should say, NC State University Libraries collection, as well as the larger TRLN collection, which was one of the goals of this project. Um, so in the top left there, you can see a little toggle that lets users toggle between um, the TRLN collection and the NC State collection. Um, in this instance, uh, the TRLN collection is uh, selected and they have the opportunity to go, and it has about 1,900 titles, and they have the opportunity to switch back to NC State, uh, which has 857 titles. Um, and this is just to show, you know, um, a record, uh, a shared title across three institutions so they can see um, uh, the holdings from all institutions. Um, so I promised in my proposal that I would talk about, like, what did it take to make Blacklight work for a consortial environment? Um, and when, I, when we talked about this, the interesting thing was that in reality, it wasn't all that much that was required. Um, and that's one of the things that was kind of interesting about this project. One of the biggest problems we thought we were going to have to solve at the outset was uh, this concept of rolling up records, right? Which is like in a shared catalog, we want to gather all the institutional records for, for a single title into one result. Users don't want to see duplicate titles. Um, so when we looked into this, it was pretty much already built in Solar. So Solar is used outside of the library community and this idea of grouping across variations is like a relatively common use case in e-commerce. Um, so when we're searching the TRLN context, we use Solar's Collapse Query Parser, gathers all the documents that match on a particular field for each result in the result set and collapses them into a single result. Uh, this lets us also favor the local institution's record in each set. So if I'm searching from the Duke interface, I will see the metadata for the Duke record if there's a collection of records for the same title from different institutions. Um, and then we also use the expand component. That's what lets us get access to the data in the records that have been kind of bundled up so that we can see the holdings across all the institutions. Now, in order for uh, collapse functionality to work properly, uh, we have to have shared identifiers, obviously. That's like, seems pretty obvious. Um, so since our primary goal was to avoid record duplication across institutions, we were not trying to solve Ferber. We're not trying to create works, something much simpler. So we use OCLC number as our primary match point. Of course, that leaves out some large record sets. For instance, the TRLN institutions all load serial solutions records for e-journals and e-books, and they don't have OCLC numbers in them. Um, so we use, uh, we use other identifiers where we can as match points, like serial solutions uh, ID numbers. Um, and for the user interface, um, we added a new controller that inherits from Blacklight's catalog controller to provide the TRLN view of results. So Blacklight's set up to have different inherited controllers that provide different scope views of your index. So we're really able to just extend Blacklight as designed to provide this interface. 
Um, and then we added a small widget to enable users to toggle between uh, scope. So developing, I'm gonna skip to the next slide because I think I only have five seconds. Um, this is where you can learn more. Um, all the code is here on GitHub. Um, this is a, a TRLN, so there's other repositories, but the repositories I talked about in this project are here. These are the team members. The people in bold are actually here. Here are their um, uh, Slack channel nicks, and then the, um, the notes have uh, email addresses and things like that if you'd like to learn more. I don't know if we have time for questions. I think the answer is probably no. I'm going to escape. <laughs>so please ignore the title of my talk. Instead, look at my 13-year-old Code for Lib t-shirt. I looked at it for, it seems like the first time this morning, and I found out that at the bottom, uh, it says, well, at the top it says Code for Lib 2006, and then it's like a graphic. And then at the bottom, in tiny letters, it says, unleash it. So, I think some of us have coders that are coders who want to unleash our librarian, and some of us are librarians uh, who want to unleash our coder, and some of us are neither, and we want to unleash both. So go unleash it. So let's see how this works. Yeah, so I do most of my work uh, on free ebooks uh, on Gluit, now Project Gutenberg. Uh, and uh, do lots of stuff on GitHub. And uh, my non ebook stuff is uh, done as part of GlueJar. So I'd like to start with an audience poll. I want to see a show of hands uh, about each of the words that I'm going to say, whether you think of them as un uh, favorable or unfavorable. Um, so, first, blockchain. Show of hands, favorable. Nobody's favorable? Oh, come on. Don't forget what I, my title, as I said. <laughs> OK, unfavorable. A lot of people aren't raising their hands. You don't have to know anything to answer this question. I guarantee it. <laughs> All right, so this is an unfavorable crowd. The, the last. Uh, time I did this talk, it was like 90% favorable. So things are, things are happening. All right, second word, snake oil, favorable. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Unfavorable, snake oil. All right, nobody likes snake oil. Well, okay. Uh, so since I'm talk my, my title has both snake oil and blockchain in it, um, I want to... to uh, use it. another word, omega-3 fatty acids. Favorable? Unfavorable? All right. So, well, what is snake oil anyway? Well, you are about to find out. Uh, snake oil, uh, the oil from the Chinese water snake in particular, has the highest concentration of icosapentaenoic acid among all of the, the oils you can get naturally. And icosapentaenoic acid is a word that I've been practicing pronouncing for about a week. <laughs> it's one of the three important uh, omega-3 fatty acids. 
And in fact, it does have analgesic properties. It's helpful for the relief of muscle pain. So when Chinese miners, uh, Chinese workers brought this in to the country in uh, the 1800s, uh, they brought with them Chinese, traditional Chinese medicine and they were worked really hard and so they had a lot of muscle pain and so they used snake oil and it got to be popular. Um, like, so it's, it's like a real Chinese medicine. Uh, so why do none of you like the word snake oil? Well, what happened was that, um, well, okay, snake oil from the real Chinese water snake is expensive and it's exotic. It's from Asia. And, uh, but it's also hard to tell from the cheaper oils and other ingredients that you would put in a liniment to relieve muscle pain. So guess what happened? Entrepreneurs developed um, uh, various preparations uh, that they sold as snake oil <clears throat> uh, because it was good marketing hype and people would buy stuff if it had snake oil in it because they heard that snake oil was really good stuff. And this is a picture of uh, one of the, the more prominent uh, snake oil liniments. Uh, Clark Stanley was known as the snake oil king. And I love some of the, uh, the, the descriptions of, of what it's good for. It's good for man and beast. Uh, but also, it's good for bites of animals, insects, and reptiles. So it was sort of a magic thing. Uh, but around the turn of the century, people started uh, having bad experiences with uh, expensive preparations they got from patent med medicine salesmen. And in 1917, Clark Stanley got in legal trouble uh, and a court had his uh, liniment analyzed and found that there was no snake oil in his snake oil liniment. So today, uh, snake oil has come to mean uh, something that is a fraudulently hyped solution for some problem and that snake oil doesn't do what it's claimed to do. And the bad name of snake oil, of course, has been influenced by prejudice. It's Chinese. And around the turn of the century, there was like the, the whole uh, yellow peril thing like we, we have today <clears throat> uh, for other things. Uh, and of course, snakes. <clears throat> so, what does this have to do with blockchain? Well, first of all, blockchain is the miracle technology behind Bitcoin. Uh, and it is truly, it almost seems miraculous because it appears to have solved a very difficult problem in, with cryptocurrencies, and that is to, to avoid double spending uh, in a distributed system, a system without a central uh, source of truth. Um, now, however, um, last few years, it's been widely marketed as, a, as something that can solve all problems. If you have a problem that you don't know how to solve, uh, someone comes and says, okay, we can apply blockchain to this. And nobody understands how blockchain works, so that seems reasonable, don't you think? Uh, the problem is that it's uh, fabulously expensive. So for example, uh, to, to put a gigabyte of information on the Ethereum blockchain uh, costs about $4 million. Now, nobody would do that if they had to pay it had to pay it all themselves, but because there's this cryptocurrency associated with it that has bubbles and everything, um, <clears throat> in the end, it costs a lot of money to do uh, what you'd think would be easy. Uh, for reference, uh, putting um, a, a gigabyte of data on S3 costs two cents per month. So two cents versus $4 million. That is kind of a big difference. Uh, on the positive side, blockchain is almost, well, it's never really needed, except if you're doing uh, cryptocurrency or if you're 
figuring out how to um, uh, do trading and marketing of large integers. Um, but in most cases, you don't really need it. And to solve all of the scaling problems with Bitcoin or with blockchain, all you have to do is remove the blockchain and use all the good stuff that you've been doing else and everything works fine. So uh, why are we talking about blockchain at all? Other than the $4 billion that VCs have put into blockchain companies. Uh, well, there are a number of attributes of blockchain that sound really good. Let's, let's take a look at those attributes. Um, uh, blockchain can provide transactions that live on a public distributed ledger. So it offers transparency. Uh, on the other hand, it's kind of hard to get all the data out of the blockchain because it's big and it's moving all, all, all the way around. And so um, you can hide stuff there too. Uh, it doesn't have a central authority and you don't have to have a trusted party to be the, the uh, source of truth. Um, it's, so it's decentralized. However, the software really is centralized. And there are things called mining pools uh, where in order to survive, miners of cryptocurrency gather together and share their winnings. Uh, and uh, in theory, if you have one mining pool that has more than 50% of the mining power or computing power, uh, they could, in principle, uh, uh, cheat the rest of the, the people using the cryptocurrency. Um, so anonymity, participants can be anonymous. However, wherever the blockchain touches the real world, uh, you lose the anonymity. So like if you use it to buy something, the person that you pay can trace back your ID and find out that in fact it was you that, that paid and you're no, no longer anonymous. Um, it uses value tokens to lock a consensus mechanism, uh, which results in the quality of immutability. So you can't change the past. Now, in most applications that we use, real hard immutability is actually a problem. So uh, that you always have to rethink and see whether you really want that. Um, and, uh, and finally, the, the, the consensus mechanism which I'll talk about a little bit more, uh, prevents double spending. And that's the real hard part that uh, means it's useful cr for cryptocurrency, at least in principle. And that provides some security, unless you have bugs. And of course, we all know you always have bugs. Uh, what we should be asking ourselves is, which of these properties do we really need? And what's the best way to achieve those properties for the systems that we build. So for example, if you really want immutability, why don't we look around to see what people who are skilled in, in uh, public key cryptography and modern computer science have done? Well, the way they have achieved uh, immutability in a scalable and cost-effective way is by publishing hashes in the New York Times classified section. And what happens is that the New York Times helpfully makes millions of copies of the newspapers, and you in the li your libraries have archived uh, these newspapers with uh, records of the hashes of their hash chain at, for each day in the past. So there's no way that anyone can go back and change the history. Uh, this is a company called Surety that has been doing this for uh, over 20 years. What about transparency? Well, <clears throat> uh, I'd like to point you at uh, the certificate transparency log, uh, which uh, is now over 600 million nodes and growing, and it is being used uh, to provide transparency to the certificate uh, issuing system that is securing all of our HTTPS communications. 
The problems, one problem that that system has is the possibility of misissued certificates, uh, rogue certificate authorities, uh, and stolen certificates. So uh, if you have, so, so browsers and um, uh, certificate authorities need to have uh, ways to see all the other certificates that are being issued. And so this system has been built. And do you think they use blockchain? No, 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 no. They use uh, all this cryptographic uh, uh, technology um, where it's needed to make sure that uh, the issuers uh, are, are in fact putting things on multiple uh, transparency logs. And behind the scenes, your browser is contacting uh, uh, certificate authorities and, and in a way that uh, allows this transparency of certificates to be securing your web sessions right now. What about automated consensus? Now that sounds really cool, but are you sure you want computers to be deciding what things go on that distributed ledger of yours? If there's any, any um, dispute, how does, it, how does it get resolved? Um, well, I say that instead of using blockchain, you should be making it easy for people to communicate and exchange information in cryptographically signed blocks and make it easy to fork mods and to merge them when consensus is reached. Well, guess what? That's what GitHub does. So do that. All right. Did, did I go through? Yeah. I, I missed talking about the different consensus mechanisms. Let me just go back and, and cover that. So, uh, Bitcoin uses a consensus mechanism that relies on proof of work. And so this is basically the most powerful computers decide what things get put on the blockchain. Uh, an alternate method is called proof of stake. And that's basically where rich, the richest people decide what goes on the blockchain. You may have heard of a so-called permissioned blockchain, in which case the privileged decide. And uh, the blockchains use something called a, a Byzantine agreement protocol. Um, and I, it's not me that's calling this a Byzantine protocol. It's actually the name of the protocol. Right. So suppose you need decentralized systems. So I want you to imagine an application where you use cryptographically secured peer-to-peer -peer network, maintaining a synchronized archive of validated library materials. Doesn't that sound like a great use for blockchain? We'll use a consensus mechanism exactly like the one in IBM's Hyperledger permission blockchain, the, the Byzantine whatever, right? Uh, and, but in, you know, instead of making it um, run on cryptocurrency, let's power it with green renewable library goodness. Now, wouldn't that be an awesome blockchain? Does anyone know what I'm talking about? That's locks, <laughs> right? How many of you, are there, is there anyone here running a lock server? Yes, are you getting rich with the locks coins? <laughs> no, no, but you're doing good stuff, right? So locks is a distributed network it uses all the same kinds of technologies uh, used by blockchain, and it's been operating for over 20 years and is powered by libraries. Uh, so I call this stuff not chain because it's not blockchain. It's made of the same stuff as blockchain is, but it's not chain. So I want you to come away from this talk thinking about how to use the healthy components of blockchain to solve your problems. And I want to discourage you from trying to sell an old car using a new label, even if it's a 20-year-old car that, that still runs well. So just a few areas where we might apply not chain. Well, come on, let's, let's start saving the history of our metadata. Let's crypto sign 
our metadata and edits so we know who made those good things and bad things happen. Uh, tell your vendors to sign their digital content so you know that it's real. Um, don't tolerate unhashed passwords. I know most of you aren't doing that, but there's still unhashed passwords out there sitting in library systems. And uh, you know I've been pushing HTTPS. Let's stop tolerating insecure network connections. Uh, so you know, do the easy stuff first. Don't worry about the, the blockchain, which has some severe problems that uh, still are difficult to solve. Bottom line is, never mind the blockchain. Here's a hex digest. <laughs> so to finish up, uh, icosapentaenoic acid is good for you, and it's fun to say, but it's not magic. Um, so thank you. <clears throat> And we have 30 seconds for questions. All right, well, I'll be out in the hall and you can look at my t-shirt or you can ask me questions about blockchain. Thanks. Thank you, Eric. Okay, this is the complicated part because I'm supposed to announce the breakout sessions. Um, I think somebody has an image of that. Ah, there it is. First, though, a couple reminders. Um, please don't stream and like on the conference Wi-Fi. Uh, if you want to do that, do it on the hotel Wi-Fi because it's really causing problems. And then the live chat on the YouTube stream has been turned off. If you need to report an issue with the live stream,